Welcome to the Better Business, Better Life show. I'm your podcast host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor. In this podcast, I interview business owners, EOS implementers, and business experts who share with you their experiences, tips, and tools to help you create not only a better business, but also a better life. At the end of each show, you will have three tips or tools that our guests share that you can implement immediately into your life. If you want more information or want to get in contact, you can visit my website, debra.coach. That's D-E-B-R-A dot coach. Please enjoy the show. And today I am joined by Matt Schaup. And I've been really careful to make sure I get that right. Otherwise, it's going to make me sing on this podcast. Um, Matt is a guy that is just trying to make the world a better place is what I learned from just having a quick chat to him. Um, he's a business owner. He's an author. He's a speaker. He runs a judicial center. He's got all these things going on. But really, he's just about making the world a better place. So welcome to the show, Matt. Deborah, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to connect with you today. Yeah, same here. I'm looking forward to you sharing your story with uh, with our listeners. We had a w- little chat as we always do beforehand, um, yeah. and there's a few stories in there, isn't there? So let's let's yeah. hear a little bit about you. <laughs> yeah, you know, I grew up on the east coast of the United States in New Jersey till I was ten, and then my family moved out to uh, Colorado, and I just remember being a troublemaker as a kid. I uh, was was really brilliant in school, and they couldn't keep me busy enough, and uh, I got kicked out of a lot of things. I got told actually to sit down and shut up and stop talking. So it's just fun that I get to talk and speak, and, and that's part of my profession. So um, I, but, I think we're kindred yeah. spirits. I think yes. I'm, I'm the New Zealand female version of you because I'm a troublemaker. Exactly the same thing at I school. love it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so but also we, super smart, and that was the problem. I, I think it, it's you know it was. I was always I was bored. Yeah, I was I was bored, and that typical like sit down, shut up school environment, do what you're told. I just didn't connect with that, and nobody ever came along and saw like, man, this kid's creative. He's he's got an entrepreneurial spirit, and I I found out really quickly that I did. We moved to Colorado, and I asked my parents for uh, two hundred dollars to buy a big boom box. If you remember those big you know CD players, the double cassette, yeah. and all my friends, their parents were just buying them for them, and they're like, "Nah, you got to go find a way to make your own money." Listen, you cut our grass for four dollars a week, so you can wait fifty weeks. Do the math. I go, "Yep, I do the math." I go, "That's too long. How about I go cut some other neighbor's grass?" And my parents let me take the lawnmower. So my first business, it's unofficial, was um, cutting grass. And then in the winter in Colorado, shoveling snow. And then I would go pedal candy bars and soda out of my middle school locker. But that, like, that gave me such uh, a feeling of accomplishment and certainty and identity and, and just feeling good. Um, you know, one of the things I went through growing up was a lot of bullying. So I was never confident in a lot of spaces you know, I'm great at school, but then I'm in trouble for doing it too fast. And then I'm getting beat up on the playground. But man, you give me something to sell, you know, and I'm selling it. So I made that money, bought that boom box. And uh, leading into college, I worked with a college painting company all four years of college and uh, learned all about residential paint contracting and made a bunch of money doing it. And then I spent all of that money and then I spent more than that. So I graduate college in debt. I did a semester in Spain. Uh, for a study abroad semester, fell in love with the country. And then I came back and I fell in love with my now wife, Emily, uh, met her in the basement of a bar on salsa night <laughs> or salsa dancing. Um, and, you know, that all leads to this like really critical moment for me. I, I leave the painting business after college because it's not sexy, right? It's, it's blue collar, it's dirty, it's seasonal, it's in the summer. And I'm like the optics of it weren't great. For me, I want to go do something, you know, suit and tie business guy, Matt. So I'm in a See. bank. Yeah. And my, and my mortgage, Matt tie. And I just hate Deborah. Like I hate life every day. They're, they're telling me what to do. It's like school all over again with all these rules and all these things. And I said, Hey, let me be creative in how I reach out to these people. And they're like, Nope, you got to do it this way. So I, I knew that I'd be leaving, come home every day and tell Emily just how much I was just not enjoying this. And I'm plotting my escape, right? So just you know, coming into the bank office one Tuesday morning and uh, they brought in a new leadership. They brought in a new president and he calls me into his office. I'm like, cool, I get to meet the new president. Maybe I can share some of my creative ideas, right? <laughs> so like literally, I remember this like it was yesterday, right? This is almost yes, 20 years ago. I, I walk in, I stick out my hand to shake it. I'm standing at his desk and he's you know sitting here in his banker's desk, you know, big table. And he doesn't stick his hand out. And um, I go, hey, like, nice to meet you. And he said, go get all your shit, put it in a box, you're fired. Oh, my gosh. And I'm, you know, I'm a little fiery, wild 
22, 22 year old. I go, what? What are you talking about? He said, you heard me. I didn't stutter. Go get it. You're done. And, and then this is, this is what was really interesting is he, he cinches up the tie and he's like, maybe you should go back and do that, that painting thing, you know, very, in a very condescending tone. Um, he's like, go be a dirty painter. And I'm like, all right. So I grabbed my stuff, put it in the box. I flew the double single finger salute to him. And I walked out of that bank and I remember standing there. Like I just, I remember the sun beating down on my face and I'm like, holy cow, I don't have money coming in. I can go do whatever I want, which was great. And I, and I hated this place. So I'm like, that's great, but this isn't great. I got no money, but I can go do whatever I want. But now I got to go tell my wife. So I'm, I'm battling and I'm like, man, I got 12 minutes to drive home and tell Emily what happened and um, jump in the car. And as I closed that door, I remember stepping in the parking lot into the car, closing the door, I'm never working for somebody again. Just, just never going to do it. And I get to go do this business thing. Like I know, I know that's what like God put in me. That's how I'm wired. That's how I'm built. And I said, all, but what do I do? All I know how to do is paint houses. I don't really like painting houses, but I know how to do it. So I call a couple of the painters on the way home from college painting. And I said, Hey guys, in about a month, if you want, we're going to be really busy. And uh, one, one of the guys is like, Oh, did you get fired from the bank? I told you that wasn't going to work out. And then I come home and uh, it was it was an early lunch. Emily's like, why are you home so early? And I said, you know, got got let go. And it was it was a shock. But mm -hmm. she I remember the question. She said, what are you going to do about it? That was it. And I told her, I said, we're going to start a painting company. She says, OK. And she said, I've got your back. And she was working an hourly part time job at that point. And I said, you just you just watch. We're going to get this thing going so big that you're going to be able to quit this job. I'll probably need you in the business. But her goal was to stay at home with kids and raise the kids back then. So that's what we did. I took my last hundred dollars and went and bought some crooked cut business cards at Kinko's. And I just went out like I did when I was 10. I knocked on doors. I beat the street and uh, we built a multi-million dollar company in five years. I mean, it was, it was yeah. awesome. Yeah. That is phenomenal. Yeah. Um, interested in sort of, you know, what, what did you learn the most about running your own business through that journey? That, that it's, it's a, it's a roller coaster of ups and downs. And I think now, right, 2023, back in 2005, we didn't have that social media where, you know, everything looks sexy. Everything looks glamorous. You see all of the Instagram reels of the entrepreneurs and the, 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 the fun peak of the roller coaster, right? Like those are there. Those are great. Had many of them, but then it's just hard. There, there are times when you are at the bottom of that thing. You're in the mud, you're in the crap, you're in the, just the junk and you want to give up and you don't know what to do and it's confusing and it's scary. And I've just enjoyed or learned to just enjoy riding that roller coaster and mm -hmm. understand that some people will never understand it. And, and you've got to connect with other people that, that are in that space and understand it. Um, and then understanding where you are in that journey. Uh, and asking, you know, asking for help when you're down here, not getting too much ego and excitement when you're up here because it can change, you know. Yes. <laughs> um, and then the other biggest lesson was putting people over profits. I was I was young. I was a young, aggressive. I was a jerk to work for. I was X, <laughs> X's and O's, dollars and cents. If you work for me, you know, you better be working and I'm cracking that whip and you're just a cog in my wheel. So I learned a lot about leadership and people and uh, figuring out where I needed to be a better person so I could make other people better. Cause, cause I wasn't in the early days. Like I, I wouldn't have been on your podcast in 2005. You wouldn't want to talk to me. <laughs> you'd, have a, you'd have a bit of a dick. Were you okay? Fair enough. A dick? Yeah, no, I was, I was yeah. a jerk. Yeah, I was a dick. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yep, you can say it. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, so that is, that's a really interesting lesson though, isn't it? Because I, I yeah. find it fascinating that you told me that, um, that you know the, the the guy at the bank was a bit of a dick to you too, right? He didn't he really treat was. you with respect. Yeah. yeah, and then and then you went out into your own business and almost kind of recreated some of the stuff that you perhaps didn't like at the mm -hmm. bank. I did. I, I ended up I ended up being the guy that I you know that I totally totally despised. And you know I think yeah. for me that was a, a product of you know the environment that I grew up in because uh, of my early days of being bullied and really needing to figure out like money on my own. I was really driven by a sense of, you know, I was talking to somebody about this the other day of, you know, your net worth is not your self-worth. And, you know, I 
was was kind of having that wired into me as a young kid. So, you know, I'm like, hey, the more I strive, the more I work, the more money I make, the more people are going to accept me. Right. Um, yeah. And I just and I didn't know how to do it. And that's all I focused on. And, you know, another big lesson, which I'd love to talk about, because I think this is really, really circles around what you do is your business will only be as healthy as you are personally. Mm -hmm. And, and I think it is super important for entrepreneurs to understand their story. Like if they need help, professional help, counseling, masterminds, uh, coaching, like that, that stuff is huge. Um, and that was a big part of my life that really transitioned me into a, a better space in business. Cool. So was there a particular point? Was there something that happened that made you kind of go, whoa, hold on a second, this isn't quite working at the way I thought it would? <laughs> it, you know, yeah. So it was always that the little things would happen. So I'm like, why do we have a revolving door in business? How come everybody else doesn't want to work as hard as me? Why is this person's problem this problem? making it? So is everybody else. So I'm working with a coach. Uh, I was part of Entrepreneurs Organization for oh, uh, for okay. a number of yep. years, EO, <laughs> and they brought in a speaker. He was uh, he was an ex um, West Point graduate, just big guy, right in your face kind of coach. And you know he did a lot of NLP type of coaching, and I ended up working with him. Our team did, and then I did individually. And I, I was just you know, getting into one of my programs again one day about how it's everybody else's fault. And um, I'm very aggressive, you know, and yeah. people will tend to shut down when I do that. But he got right back in my face and he said, listen, man, he goes, all I hear you saying is that you're the common denominator of the problem. So he goes, maybe you're the problem. You know, maybe you're the jerk. He goes, did you ever, did you ever think about that? And um, that was a, that was a big wake up call. So I, that, that moment really made me reflect on all of these little situations where I just didn't know how to treat people, um, mm -hmm. based on, based on where I came from and, and kind of how I was treated. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And then he goes, here's, here's what I would suggest. And he made some suggestions and, you know, I, I remember going back to the team that next day and just saying, Hey guys, you know, I've made this, I've made this realization. I, I was called out. And I'm really considering what business is going to look like if we keep doing it this way and it's not good and I'm, and I'm sorry. So moving forward, I'm committing to change. I call that the three C's of changing your story. Uh, it's part of, you know, the painted baby book. And then from there, I just went on this fun and amazing journey of personal development, uh, coaching, therapy, masterminds, more coaching, and then pulling everybody in the company into these things too and doing it together. And it was amazing. I must admit, um, EO was kind of uh, pivotal in my in my um, entrepreneurial career as well. I think that having those peers around you and being challenged mm -hmm. on things. And, and of course, EO has a very, very similar philosophy around, actually, it's not just about business, it's about business and life and how do yeah. you make sure you look after you as a whole person. And I always mm -hmm. also say that, you know, that, uh, you've got to have a personal coach. You've got to have a peer group, which is your EOs or your yeah. tech or your vestiges. And then you've got to have, um, in, in my opinion, an operating system for your business as well, mm -hmm. so that you know how your business is going to operate. Yes. Um, we're going to come, I'm going to come back the painted baby thing because that's yes, really I'm going to tell you my little story about that as well but in terms of how did you even get involved with the EO and why did you get involved with the EO yeah the first introduction I had to EO I was in college college painting and the VP mm -hmm. of the state of Colorado um, because Colorado was a million dollar division he was able to join EO and he took all of the college students to an event and that was the first time I heard about it. And it was like, hey, this is for million dollar business owners and there's great networking, great learning, great speakers. And uh, we met a guy that owned a bunch of companies and was just talking about that. He was probably 35, 40. And on that day, I just remember, I, I want to run a million dollar business someday. So I remember three years into the painting company, I reached out to EO, I think it was 2007. And then they're like, now you got to do it two years in a row. I don't know if you remember that, but they go, you got to, you got to do it consecutive years. So then 2008 was when, uh, when I jumped in there. Excellent. Okay, good. So painted baby. So this is, this is an interest. This is a, a complete segue of sorts. Um, so you have written a book called painted baby. Yes. And I was just talking to a colleague before I came on the podcast saying, I'm about to go meet with this Matt guy. I got your name wrong by the way, but anyway, and I said, he's got this book called painted babies. I said painted babies. So he Googled painted babies. And when you Google painted babies, something completely different comes up. Yeah, not my book. Um, yeah, no, not your book at all. So it was like, okay, maybe I've got that wrong. So I had to go back and look. So that's painted uh -huh. baby and I had a look at it. Yes. Um, but so this book is not about um, little girls who get doled up and go and do um, 
pageants. This no. is something completely no. different, right? So t- tell us what the book is about. <laughs> yeah, the, the premise of, of the book is that in life, leadership, and business, we paint a picture of perfection. And that prevents true connection with people. And I learned that in in business. I'm sitting at a sales appointment in 2011. I'm about to close the biggest contract of my life. It's 20 times the size of of a normal contract. And I tell you, Deborah, I got really good in college painting and after at sales, right? The old school uh, feature benefit, objection handling, pre-closing, right? All all of that. And I'm, I'm Mr. Sales Guy. And I'm going to go close this deal. And it's with a client that I've already done business with. I mean, I, I know the guy. We've worked for him. So I'm sitting there, you know, with my fancy pen and I present the contract. I slide it across the table. I drop the pen and, and I'm waiting. You know, I'm quiet and I'm waiting for him to sign. Right. It's just. Uh, mm, yep. And he pushes it back. because I'm Textbook sales. Yeah, yep. Textbook sales. <laughs> yep. Right. A plus five star everything. And he sends it back to me. He's like, no, nope, not ready to do this. This is this is really weird because he's a very decisive guy. So oh, let me let me try the either or close. So I'm trying my different close techniques and he just keeps sending it back. And I go, what, what's going on? This is weird. This is kind of off. And uh, we're back and forth. And he goes, you know what? He's he he picks up this marketing brochure that, that I gave him. I said, look, I've got better business bureau, a plus reviews. I mean, look, your your job is right here on page seven. Like, look how you know, the work is great. You know, it's always perfect. And he's like, cut the crap, Matt. This house you're about to go do work for, it's my second home. It's my million dollar baby. It's a vacation home for him. Uh, The guy's very well off, very self-made guy. And he picks this marketing brochure up. He says, this thing's crap. And you know it. And he throws it across his office. He said, tell me about a time that you screwed up and what you did about it. And I had never been asked that question as a salesperson or a business owner before. Mm -hmm. So I go to the memory bank and I shared a couple of stories of, you know, we painted the wrong color on a house once the paint store mixed up the paint. He's like, you know, that's not a big deal. He goes, that happens all the time, I'm sure. And it did. And I said, well, we painted the right color once, but we painted it on the wrong house. And and he kind of leans in. He's like, you painted the wrong house. I said, yep, we accidentally uh, sent our crew to a house and mixed up the streets and the addresses. And, and we did. We literally prepped an entire house that we weren't supposed to. But but when I when I shared that mistake, he leans in and he was hooked and he was engaged. And I was like, I'm on to something right now. I went a little bit bigger, a little bit more vulnerable. And I just want to close the sale. Right. I'm young. I'm, I'm still young into my business. And he's like, still not good enough. And I said, Bill, what else do you want from me? What else can I tell you? And he just goes, I feel like you've got something better. And I said, fine, I got one for you. I've never told it. And I can't believe I'm about to do this. I said, we painted a baby. Okay. But if I tell you about it, you have to sign the contract. And I'm still just, just knucklehead, old school closing guy. Right. And he leans back. He's like, well, tell me, tell me the story. And what happened was, was this, a paint job takes about three days to do typically. And on the last day, we typically will spray with our, our paint spray gun, any metal doors, garage doors, entry doors to, to the home. And we're working on this home in Windsor, Colorado, wonderful family. There's a mom, she has a nine month old baby. She would come out every day to greet the painters, bring them drinks, bring them snacks. Oh, that's beautiful. I love how the paint job's coming together. And we're literally almost buckled up and finished up with this job. And I'm not on the job site. I'm 20 minutes away doing a bank deposit. And my phone rings and it starts ringing and it keeps ringing and I'm shutting it off and putting it in my pocket. And I come out of the bank. I missed about 10 calls from my painter. His name's Raul. I'm like, I better call him back really quick. And I call him back. He is screaming on the other end of the line. So I hear Raul, who speaks both English and Spanish. He's, Mateo, Mateo, come quick. Oh my gosh, you finally answer the phone. And, and then I hear a woman screaming and a baby crying. And he's like, Mateo, Mateo, the paint and the boom and the baby, I don't know, come quick. I paint the baby. And he hangs up the phone. <laughs> he hangs up the phone. And, and, and I'm laughing now. Yeah, I'm laughing now, but I'm like, what, what, did, what just happened? What does beep, 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 everything. So I jump in the car. I never drove so fast from, from one town to another. And I pull up and his brother, uh, Bloss, is standing at the truck, just folding up drop cloths covered in black semi-gloss paint. There's a trail of paint going up the driveway through the back gate. And I go, I come in and I just follow the trail. And Raul's down on his hands and knees. He's scrubbing paint off of the flagstone. It's in the grass the fence, 
the barbecue grill, the deck, and it, it splattered all over the door he was supposed to paint. So he's literally about to pull the trigger of a spray gun. And we had this one in a million jam where the gun jammed, but then there was also a little fitting that was just off kilter. And when he pulled that trigger, the, the pressure came through, paint exploded everywhere. And mama's standing right there with baby, right, right behind, uh -huh. right behind. So yeah, we, we painted a baby. So I'm back to the sales appointment. Now I'm back with Bill and he's, he's mm -hmm. just like, what? So what happened? He's hooked. He's yeah. wanting to know about the drama and the plight. And, and, and you know, I've built up this, the, this story and the mom and the baby and Bloss and Raul. And, and he wanted to know what happened. So I told him what happened. I mean, we took ownership of it. We we had to clean up. We had to make sure the baby was okay. And the yeah, baby I'm, I'm was okay. But how was the baby? Yeah, you're Well, let me tell you. Yeah, so I'll go right here. So no no babies were harmed in the making of the book or the story. Um, you know, it's just the paint the paint didn't get, you know, the baby's eyes or anything like that. Uh, but but got everywhere. So what I let Bill know is like, listen, we, we handled it. That was a bad moment. This is what we did. And if this was to happen on your job, this is what we would do. And you could see, you know, the, the interest in the story turned to this, you know, internal, he's, he's putting himself there and he goes, okay, I can deal with that. And, uh, I said, so Bill, that, that's what I got for you. I don't know what else to tell you. I'm all out of closes. I'm all out of everything. I, I love you. I've done business with you for a long time and, and you just let me know what you want to do. I'm, I'm just stumped. And he says, boom, sticks the hand out. You're the kind of guy I want to do business with. Like that's the kind of guy that I was waiting to have show up. And I realized in that moment that, that I had never done that. It was always the, the shiny marketing brochure. And he yep, really made me are. realize that. Yeah. And um, that's important, right? Like you want to have mm -hmm. that, you want to have credentials, but uh, there is a way where humans connect when one person decides to go first and be vulnerable and say, you know, here's where I look all polished and great, but man, I just had a really bad incident happen. I, and this is where my integrity was on the line. If I say I'm an honest company and I'm going to do the right thing, but I've never been given an opportunity to not do the right thing, then, then it doesn't show that with a five-star review. You know, if I say, Hey, if we screw something up, we're going to fix it. We, we had thousands of dollars of screw up sitting right there on that job site. And, and we did. So yeah, that was, that was a wake up call for me. And then I decided to go out. I said, you know what, I'm going to, there's something going on here. I'm going to go share this story in sales appointments. And then we taught the team how to do it. Uh, and then we did a big marketing campaign. And then that's, that's my daughter on the cover of the book. We, we brought her in through paint all over her and, um, you know, marketed painted baby all over town. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a beautiful story of how humans connect and it challenges and encourages readers to uh, think about how they need to change their story, whether it's personally or professionally, so they can connect with, with clients, but then also with other people in life at a deeper level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, if you think about it, it's part of the, the the philosophy I have when I'm actually interviewing people as well for for jobs is that you want to know. Mm -hmm. Of course, we want. To, I celebrate success. Absolutely, that's yeah, a, you know yeah. that's a, a key part of who I am. But I want to know how you handle things when things go wrong. I want to mm -hmm. know how you how you react when you're when you're triggered, when you're under pressure, when all those things are happening. What what yeah. really happens and how do you actually behave? So yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Well, and some of my so, biggest memories in in business are just that the times when something doesn't go well, something's on the line and to see everybody come together. And then as the leader, you know, you've got to go first and, and be in that space where um, people are going to trust when, when something happens, you know, COVID was a big thing. When, when that happened, we had to make some decisions and there, there was kind of two options. There was one way to go where a lot of people were going and we decided to go another route that was the right thing to do and the right way to do it. So um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's been such a fun journey. It's been such a fun journey. Yeah, and I've loved like sharing the message with people. I'm keen to hear what you did in COVID now, though, of course. So what did you do that, that, that was different in COVID? So, you know, what I, what I saw during COVID is that everybody was, uh, everybody was making cuts, right? So everybody got scared. Nobody knew what was going on. And I remember we're, we're sitting around the table as a, as a company and, you know, I'm seeing friends, other business owners that are like, yeah, we're just cutting people. We got to protect ourself and our own. And I'm like, you know what? If anybody's going to cut anything right now, it's going to be me. So I cut my salary down like close, close to in half to create some more financial runway. Now, luckily we were a necessary business, so we weren't too affected, but there was a couple of week period right there where we were envisioning 
you know, just, just everything crashing and burning, right? Which I think a lot of people were. And I just said, here, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to cut things down so we can have more runway. We're not cutting anybody. We're going to figure this out. We're going to pivot. We're going to adapt, whatever that looks like. And they sat there and they're like, wow, you know, that's, that's not yeah. what just happened to my friend. Or, you know, we had a spouse of a team member who, who was let go. Um, same, we have our jujitsu academy at the time. That's, that's in person, close contact. And we yes. told everybody, we called every single member and we said, listen, uh, we can't train together. We are absolutely willing to uh, freeze your membership and just, just stop paying and we'll figure it out. And we had just bought a building. It was crazy. And 80% of those students said, you know what? Uh, we want to support you guys. So keep, oh. keep it going. It was, it was a really beautiful thing, but. Oh, that's lovely. Oh, okay. Um, so the painted baby book is, is obviously, you know, you, you talk about, um, sharing vulnerable stories, the connections, the real connections you can make by actually doing that. Yeah. Uh, but you still have the painting business. You still have the jujitsu. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're still um, very much doing all that. How do you, how do you manage to keep the balance right? Because I think for a lot mm -hmm. of us, um, uh, <laughs> shall we say, I think it might be adult ADHD, but that sort of high functioning, fast paced, um, want to do lots of things. Yeah. We can get overwhelmed with too much stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how do you keep that balance right? Because you've obviously got a family, you've got, mm -hmm. you know, you've got your business, you've got the, the and now you've got the speaking and the yeah. as well. Yeah. And, and you hit, you hit the nail right on the head and we're very similar, right? I'm this like ADHD mm -hmm. squirrel. I love to start things and launch things and, and I do, and I can get bored easily, but one of the big, the big keys I found is, you know, before I'm going from one business to another is making sure that business is, is running, you know, that it's got a system, it's got a process, it's got the people in place to be able to do that. Because if you're just, you know, hopping, leaving these previous things and, and you have all these plates spinning and I still, um, like honestly to this day, like right now, we have a lot of plates spinning. We have a company that we built up and we're getting ready to sell it right now just because it's, it's not going to keep going the way it should and could with the amount of attention me and my business partner don't have for it right now. So it's, it's making sure you've got the right people, the right systems, and then that that's clearly communicated. And then you let those people do their job. Cause I don't know about you, but I go, Hey, here's your job. I'm leaving. And then I swoop in. I'm like, Hey, how's it going over here? We doing, we doing okay. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, it's basically, as you know, it's part of the work that I do, right? So it's really about yeah. helping people get really clear on the vision in terms of what they want from it, who they wh who they exist for, all those things, all those yeah. wonderful things around yeah. why we exist, who we exist for, what we're doing. Um, and then, yeah, it's the letting go that's the hard part because mm -hmm. I remember when I ran the event center, I was very much, yep, I, um, I wrote lots of processes. I kind of, you know, mm -hmm. allowed, employed people to do certain things and then I just couldn't stop dabbling. And I think yeah. if you keep dabbling and keep coming back in, you're not actually allowed allowing it to become a sustainable business where it can operate without you. Mm -hmm. And I think I was very guilty of doing, we talk about delegate and elevate, which is very much about, you know, delegate the things that are not your God given unique talent, um, yeah. elevate yourself to the stuff that really adds most value. Mm -hmm. But it's really, really hard to let go because some of these it things is. you may not like, but you're reasonably good at. And so um, nobody will ever be as good as you will be. And it took yeah. a lot of time mm -hmm. to learn that actually um, you can't just delegate and not help people, but mm -hmm. you have to let them own it have accountability for yeah. it and, and talk to them about what you expect from them, but then, then let them get on with it. it. It's so true. And the two big things that I struggled with, and I think this was more more at the first level, is like, I love the sales. So I, I said, yeah. nobody can outsell me. So I train a salesperson. Like I hated the painting. So that was easy to step out of. I'm not good at it, actually. <laughs> but I would always I would always be grinding on these sales guys, you know, and, so, and salespeople. And then we're at a point now to where they, they outsell me. They sell more, they sell better. And, and I think that's a great thing. But the other thing for me is I, I love the people so much in, in the business. I love the way that we get to support families, make people's lives better. So then when I'm, you know, stepping into something else and just not spending as much time with them, I feel like I'm almost leaving them in a way. And this is just more of a personal thing that I internally struggle with, right? It's not necessarily my perception always being true, but I think entrepreneurs experience that. It's like they're, they're baby and they can't let go. And there's those people they are like, we're, we're a family here. You know, we're, we're a close knit mm -hmm. group and um, we've got each other's backs. I mean, I've seen people, you know, married here, divorced here, kids here, losing family members, all kinds of life events. And you got to be there for people.
Mm. So I'm going to explore a little bit further. You just mentioned because the sales, I can see that was absolutely your passion. That was, you know, yeah. that's what, in fact, that's really what got you into your own business and what has, has probably built it up to where it is today. Mm-hmm. Um, you've now got salespeople outsell you. What was mm-hmm. the key to being able to let go? And how did you, as a leader, enable them to actually grow into that role and do the right, you know, do the right thing? Mm-hmm. It, it was for me the idea of, coaching them and teaching them and then letting them fail. I think that's the biggest thing and not doing it for them because, you know, when, if so say you've got a salesperson and you want to train the salesperson and, and step out, um, let them just watch you do 10 appointments and then go do 10 appointments together. And then the hardest part, this was always the hardest part for me. It's phase three. And I go, you're ready for phase three. Okay. Um, is you're going to do them. I'm just going to sit there and observe and not say anything. And then I'm watching, oh, you know, I, I think this thing's going the other way. And well, so let me, and then I jump in, right? So really letting, letting people fail um, and letting people make the decision, make the call based on whatever processes and protocols and company values, all the guiding lights. And that person makes that decision and say it's the wrong decision and say you lose money, say you miss the sale. Uh, what you first do is you say, good job, Kevin, Jim, Kathleen, whoever that is, Steven, you made the decision. Yeah, but it's not the right decision. And but but they're seeing you as the leader, being proud of them for that. Uh, and then they go, well, that didn't go the way we wanted it to. No, it didn't. So so let's talk about that separately. But but just celebrating when they make those decisions versus you're swooping in, and then whenever there is the decision to be made, they're calling you, and you're the you're the bottleneck. So I always yep. gauge that feeling of um, ability to do that is. You know, when I'm getting emails or text messages or calls of, hey, what do you think? Or, hey, I've got the, nope, I don't have that anymore. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what I think. It's your decision. And I would get those all the time. The decision can never be made. So, mm, so it's giving them true accountability and actually mm-hmm. allowing them to really run with it. And, you know, it's yeah. interesting because when, when I'm doing my coaching, um, it's, it's really difficult sometimes because you so desperately want these businesses to succeed yeah. and you know that they're making a decision that you, you don't feel is right based on your years of experience. Mm-hmm. I could be wrong, but you don't feel that it's right. And you want to jump in, you want to rescue them, you want to save them. But the best thing you can do is just allow them to get on with it. Um, and you can, you can question and challenge and, and, and see that they're making the right decision, that they feel is the right decision. But you've yeah. got to let them actually go through it. And then mm-hmm. you've got the opportunity to learn, right? What's, what's working? What's not working? How can we do things differently? What mm-hmm. can we do better next time round? Yeah. And that's where, that's where they improve. And, and then they'll surprise you because sometimes you're yeah. sitting there thinking, oh, they're not making the right decision. They're actually making a better decision mm-hmm. than you would have made. And the company does, does one of these from it. So, yeah. And it's just, it's a, yeah. it's a hard thing. There's the, there's, there's the emotion, there's everything going on. There's the experience and just that human condition, you know, with, within mm-hmm. business. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um. Gosh, there's so much we could cover off here. I'm, I'm, I'm really interested. What's the thing you're most proud of? I usually ask this at the beginning. We're going to ask it now. What's the thing that you're most proud of in your life so far? You know, it's, ra- it's raising amazing kids. You know, I, I think it's, uh, we, I do all this for, for my family. I mean, this is why I get up and do everything that I do every day. And uh, it's really cool. I've got a 15 year old son and a 12 year old daughter. And for me, when they're out in the world, whatever they're doing in the world, when you hear other people, you know, they, they come up to me, they come up to my wife, Emily, and they're like, those are, those are great kids. You guys did uh, a, a really good job, right? Just because I see, I see so many entrepreneurs, right? And this is huge what, what you talk about. It's like, hey, you built a $50 million business and uh, you don't have a relationship with your kid. They don't even know who you are because you're never there and you're stressed out or they get the worst side of you or part of you. They get the burned out part of you, if, if anything. Um, mm-hmm. And it just, I've, I've always put my kids and my family in a position where I'm going to be there for them. I'm not going to miss sports events. We, we travel together. We do a father, son, father, daughter trip to Spain every year. And um, they're at a point now where they want to be around friends less than they want to be around mom and dad. So, I mean, I'm at this point where they're about to be, be close to getting out of the nest. And um, I do not regret any of that for, for one minute. Like I could have made more money, could have had more, could have had more money, but it's not, that's, we don't get to take any of that stuff with us. 
No, that's absolutely yeah. right. And I'm sure your kids will be very grateful to you as they get older as well for that opportunity yeah. to have time with mum and dad and, and, and I think, you know, instilling the values and, and, and sharing with them. So tell us a little about, about your love of Spain. So you've talked about taking the family there. Obviously, you speak both Spanish and English. You spend a lot of time over there. What was it about Spain that you fell in love with? It was funny. So I started studying Spanish in high school. I was really good at it. And then I ended up doing some translating at a local elementary school for parent-teacher conferences for Spanish-speaking families. So when I go to college, when I'm in Colorado State, I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I said, I'm, I almost have enough credits to do a Spanish minor, so let's just do a Spanish minor. I'm in a Spanish culture class, and um, my professor, her name's Maria Del Mar. She's from southwest Spain, uh, the city of Cadiz, and uh, just amazing lady. She's We're in Spanish culture class. She's teaching us about the history and the, and the literature and the architecture, and every day, literally, the end of class, she would say, hey, have you thought about study abroad? Have you thought about going, to, just going to Spain? She didn't do this to anybody else. Like she generally mentioned it, but she pulled me aside and harassed me. Um, <laughs> and, and after a couple of weeks, she, you know, she's like, what are you going to do next semester? I said, I'll work for the college painters, I guess. But I, I just decided, you know what? I go, let's, let's do this. I was, I was ready for a change, ready for an escape. And I signed up in October to literally within a couple of months, uh, right at the turn of the year, I flew over and spent five months in Spain, right outside Madrid. And um, I, was, I was 20 years old and very impressionable time in my life. And I mean, I just literally fell in love. It took me about a month because it was, a, it was a difficult month. There's a roller coaster there as a foreign study abroad student, uh, but I didn't want to come home. I mean, everything, the culture, the language, the people, the food, the coffee. And I yeah. said, when I left, I go, I'm going to come back here one day. And then I traveled back with my wife shortly after we got married. And then we come back with the kids every year. And now I get to take uh, business leaders on leadership adventures. We just hiked part of the Camino uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, with a group of business owners, business leaders. And we're doing a big uh, adventure immersion experience in 2024. So it's just a, a huge part of my life. It's got a piece of my heart. And um, yep. I've got so many relationships with people that I never would have met. And just so many opportunities and experiences and uh, memories, especially with the family and the kids, um, that that will just be there forever. Yeah. yeah, I must admit I'm hugely grateful to my parents. Uh, my mum was German, my dad was English, and mm -hmm. um, they encourage us to have pen friends and to travel. Mm -hmm. we brought, I was brought up in the UK and, and grew up in sort of Cyprus, and then moved over to the UK. We were encouraged to have pen friends and to visit various people, so we mm -hmm. always travelled. Like a lot of my friends in Britain never never left the UK. Um, they would, yeah. you know, it, they, they never went anywhere, but we were encouraged to go. And we um, and on the cheap, we did it camping wise. Oh yeah, you know, yeah. it was all. But it was it was so great because I think what it's done is it just broadens your horizons it gives mm -hmm. you a different perspective on things and yeah. I think it makes you less scared of stuff as well like I, I don't ever yeah. have any fear of going somewhere new I kind of go okay that'd be really cool because I know I'll learn about new cultures mm -hmm. new foods new uh, architecture new whatever yeah. it might be uh, and, and yeah. that is a, a great thing to have yeah and, and being yeah you're in this um this new environment and it's uncomfortable and you're trying to figure things out and then just the you know I I I'm very fluent in Spanish now, but not at the beginning. And I made some really classic, embarrassing mistakes. I have a fun one if we have time. But <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, <laughs> just, you know, being being lost in a city that you've never been to at three in the morning and, you know, you don't you don't have a phone yeah. and you've got to find your way back. It was just it was it was fun times. I mean, we were staying we stayed in some crazy cheap, like ten dollar a night hostels. I mean, we stayed in some scary places. It would have been better sleeping on the street or the beach, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's yep. cool. And so you're doing these retreats and things mm -hmm. there now. So I mean, um, uh, the the Camino thing is obviously quite fascinating. But what, yeah. what, what are the retreats about? What's the purpose of them? Why do you do them? Yeah, so the purpose is, um, so my, my three life's biggest passions are pour, pouring into people, right? Just w w with yep. leadership in their life and making people better. And Spain, like I love Spain and I love sharing the culture. Like we have a little free coffee bar downstairs and I'm about six of these in today and and i just want and i want to share that with people and teach them about leadership in really unique ways so we yes. did a pilot something called the ultimate immersion experience i took my leadership team there in 2022 and we spent a week doing these very intentionally curated challenges experiences and adventures so think about it's not like an Apple tours vacation where there's 30 people in the flags and you're on the tour bus. These are people I know 
that I've got really deep relationships with showing us pieces and parts of Spain that other people won't get to see. I'm experiencing just amazing food. And then we're doing these amazing race style challenges. So I took my entire team. I dropped them in another country. They've never been there. And I go, okay, guys, here's an envelope. Open it up. There's a clue. There's a couple euro in there. And uh, I'll see you in three hours. Ready? Go. Boom. And they had a challenge. And I, I teamed everybody up and then I went and had a coffee with, with my buddy Angel. And we just, we just sat there and we're like, no one's going to die. Hope they all get back. But we had, we had safeguards in place. And then when they came back and got to talk about these really uncomfortable, fun, exciting experiences that they did, it showed them what they were made of. It showed them what happened when the stress came on and how they worked together, where they weren't great at things, where they were scared to death of things. And um, they learned they learned a lot. And then we would just fellowship at the end of the day over, you know, a three hour dinner going till midnight, one in the morning, just just praising and recognizing those those things and other people. So, um, yeah, we're, we're doing that again in 2024. And then the Camino hike is more to take people that are busy. They're successful, but they can't unplug. They can't disconnect. And we literally walk 72 miles over six days. Uh, so 115 kilometers and their phones are off. There's no service mm -hmm. and we're walking and we're talking and there's themes and challenges each day. And um, I just, I just love it. We just got back with, with a group and um, this really, that's called hike of a lifetime. And all of them said, they said, you know, you really undersold this. This really was an experience and a, and a hike of a lifetime. So that's, yeah, that's something I'm just super, up. super pumped to continue doing. We're going to do uh, what's on my heart right now is like a father son Camino adventure mm -hmm. for uh, business owners who are fathers with their sons. Um, that's something that's really important to me is that, that father child dynamic. So we're looking uh, to, to do that for 2025. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. I love it. I've just she's got a, a friend who's just um, been over there um, and been following him on his videos each day, Glenn Marvin. And yeah, it looks like an amazing um, yeah. walk and staying in the monasteries and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Two more things about the whole Spain thing. So first of all, you said you had six coffees. I hope you're drinking proper coffee as in like an espresso as opposed to. It's cafe, cafe con leche. So it's a couple, it's a couple shots of really amazing yep. espresso and some steamed milk. So I tell people it's a, uh, more than a cortado, a lot less milk than a latte. Just a perfect, perfect yes. combination. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. I'm a short black girl, but I just ah, think okay. life's too short for no, well, life's too short for shitty coffee. And I just yes. I, I, one of the things I have to say I did not like about the US was the coffee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, the filtered coffee with bucket loads of milk doesn't make any sense to me. But um mm. that's just Well, my, my first experience drinking drinking coffee. So I'm sitting with my host dad and he you know, pulls out a cup and and I take his yeah. the cafetera, it's the espresso boiler, and I you know, I poured in American style. I was like, whoa, 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 Mateo, Mateo, stop, stop. Don't, don't do that. And I said, no, I got it. I'm an American. I know what I'm doing. And then I did a little bit of milk. And he goes, you don't want to drink it that way. And he goes, okay. So I, I drank this and um, it hit me. It hit me hard. Yeah. It hit me fast. And he's like, this is how you drink coffee. Let me show you. Ah, beautiful. So tell us now about the Spanish mistake. That's the one they want to hear about. <laughs> All right. You asked for it. So, you, so you're getting it. So when I was there, my my study abroad semester, it was it was April and it's hot. It's hot in Spain, in center Spain, Madrid in April. And I was still there were still certain parts of me that were very uncomfortable. I'm, I'm a foot and a half taller than everybody. I'm getting pretty good at the language, but I was just really homesick. I was really missing something American. And in every plaza in the center of any decently sized Spanish city is a McDonald's. So I knew that I could walk into McDonald's and they had the 50 cent ice cream cones and I would, that would just, it would just take me back home. So, you know, I'm a little, little sad, a little homesick. I walk into this McDonald's, I walk up, uh, I'm 20, I'm single, very attractive, you know, t about 20 year old Spanish gal there. And she says, D mate, tell me what you want. So I go to order an ice cream cone, which in Spanish, it's a cono. So cone of ice cream, you order a cono de helado. So mm -hmm. I walk up and uh, Spain has, or, and Spanish has the interesting little squiggly line that goes over the end and it actually changes the letter, which will change the word. So mm -hmm. Espanol has the little, the, the ña, the little squiggly makes a ña. So instead of ordering a cono de helado, I ordered a coño de helado. So she said, tell me what you want. I said, coño de helado. And she's like, oh. She goes, sir, caballero, sir. She goes, 
I can't give you that. And I, I immediately recognized what I did. And I ordered an ice cream vagina. <laughs> and, and I'm just like, oh, my gosh. And she's like, is this guy trying to, like, flirt with me? And she goes, no, just a big, dumb, tall, pasty American. And then she spins back around. She goes, I know what you want. She gets me the ice cream cone. And then she's like, for here to go. She goes, the other, the other one cost you more than 50 cents. And, like, set, sends me on my way. And that was just um, – I, it's a little change in the language, right? This is like like leadership. You think of like personality styles, just a little change, mm-hmm. a little squiggly line, like that changed the engagement, the conversation. Uh, and, yes. and we got to watch out for those things. But yeah, that's my, that's my most embarrassing screw up in Spanish. And, that's um, awesome. Yeah. I have a similar story myself in France because uh-huh. um, I also I speak French and German, but oh, not cool. particularly well, I might add, uh, and certainly haven't used it for a long time. And I remember when I first went to, to France, I'd been doing French lessons at school forever and thought I was really, really good. And, and you know, you can say, thank you very much, it's merci beaucoup. Um, mm-hmm. But if you actually say um, merci beaucoup, it actually means thank you, beautiful bottom. <laughs> hey, hey. So, yeah, yeah. So yeah. you've got to be a little bit careful about that. Watch the yes, intonation. Just, 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 just a sight, sight change and intonation can actually mm-hmm. make it. And this is one of my things about business. I, I think yeah. that um, we're losing the art of having like, you know, face-to-face conversations. Yeah. And when you look at things like email and text messages, they can be really easily misunderstood they because can. you haven't got that um, – the context, if you like, in terms of, you know, language is, is, is fascinating. As we just found out, it can, it can mean very, very different things. And I think that yeah. we have to be very careful that we don't try and replace what is really good communication with mm-hmm. things like email and text because it's easy. Because yeah. we do because it's easy, right? It's easy. It's easy for me to send you an email than it's it easy, to have a conversation. It's fast, but, but, I, but I've had so many missed, just missed messages when, you, when you're doing it too fast. And, and yeah, you don't have that. Agree. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good examples. There. Okay, right. Um, we could probably talk all day, but we need to kind of wrap this up. Um, give me a little, the, your three top tips or tools. What are the three things that you would share with the listeners that they could you know, go out and do something with? <laughs> yeah, in, in business especially, like remember that that we we do this for our family. Obviously, we need to yep. we need to provide, uh, but you don't get to take any of this stuff with you. So just just remember when you're in business that that you have an opportunity to impact lives and to make lives better for people and and just put put people over profit. Um, second thing, and this is a big thing, just looking back at 20 years of growing the businesses that we have is things take time and, and good things take time and they don't happen overnight. And the more and more I see culture and society progress, especially with social is you see all of this stuff where it just looks like the, the, the quick fix, you know, it's get rich quick doing whatever. And it just doesn't, it doesn't work that way. So don't, don't let those things fool you and then get a mentor, find somebody that, <laughs> that has been there, that has done that, uh, that you can really sit down and shoot straight with and be real with. And, you know, especially I'll tie in kind of a fourth, but, but part of getting a mentor is ask for help when you need it mm-hmm. um, and, and yeah. be okay standing in front of your team as the leader saying, I don't know the answer to this question. I think we feel like we always have to have the answer all the time and you're not always going to and it's totally okay to ask for help yeah i love that it's one of the things i talk about okay so people have a profit good things do take time and don't be afraid to ask for help get yourself somebody who's been there done that who can actually help you and be honest with you i think as well as have those those difficult conversations Mm -hmm. that maybe your team might not feel quite so comfortable having with you yeah yeah Brilliant. Okay. Now, if anybody wants to get in contact with you, Matt, um, either about the Painted Baby book or about the Camino, um, the, the, the different retreats and things that you yeah. run, how would they do that? Yeah, just go to my website, mattshalp.com. Um, I would suggest just uh, grab the free tools and then I'm sending everybody, I'll send you a big packet and a bucket of free tools to make life and leadership better. And then I send out emails about when these adventures are, are coming up. Oh, that is fantastic. Yeah. Hey, look, um, I've really enjoyed meeting with you. I said, I think we've got a lot, of, just listening to some of your stories, we've got a lot of things in common. We do. Um, but, <laughs> but, but I think we've also shared the same passion. So I suppose the passion is, um, for me, it's about, you know, life is too short. You've got to be doing what you love with people you yeah. love, making a big difference. Yeah. But most importantly, with time to pursue other passions, because, you know, your family is one of the most important things. You need to make sure that you're looking after yourself. Um, yeah. So I, I really, I, I love meeting a kindred soul. So thank you so much for your time. Thank okay. you for sharing so vulnerably. Yeah. Um, yeah, appreciate it. <laughs> Stay out of trouble because I know you're a troublemaker just like me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting better as I get older, but I'm, I'm not definitely not 100%. A little bit of trouble's okay. A little be. bit of trouble's all right. 
I, I like to call it adventures these days. We'll call, we'll call it that. <laughs> like it. Yeah, actually, it's really interesting. It's just a, a very, very quick thing. Um, we have got two. We don't have any children as such, my husband and I, but we have two fur babies, two, fur, two little mini schnauzers. <sighs> and um, I travel a fair bit with work and my husband always comes to the airport. And I said to him one time, he used to wait in the car and say, you know, I really want you to come and meet me at the actual arrivals. It makes me feel wanted. It makes me feel special. Uh -huh. So he started doing that. It was really cool. But the last time round, he decided to bring the two mini schnauzers oh, into the sorry. airport to meet with me, which was brilliant because I, I got out of there and these schnauzers are just so excited to see <laughs> mummy who hasn't been home for a week and my husband was excited so they were all you know wagging their bottoms and getting very excited um but of course that um we we kind of knew but we'd ignored it you're not meant to have um dogs in the airport in new zealand okay so as Everybody in the airport's um, fawning over these schnauzers. I'm having a lovely time because my schnauzers are there getting all excited about me, Apollo and Hermes. And then all of a sudden the security guard comes over mm. and it's like, what are you doing mm. with dogs in the airport? And we were in massive trouble. Um, we managed to look very sheepish and get out of it. But get out of your was, <laughs> Yeah. And so we're still getting into trouble at, in our mid fifties, but now we just call it an adventure. It was another adventure. We took it, you know, we put it on the bucket list. Yep. We've done that now. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, keep doing what you're doing. I really appreciate the time and you having me on. And, and uh, we'll come yeah. back. We, I feel like we could talk a lot more. So, yeah, we'll come back for, for round I two. So, we'll too. do another episode. Definitely. All right. I would love to do that. And I'm, I'm going to read Painted Baby as well. But don't don't put Painted Babies into Google because you won't find it. That I, haven't, I haven't even Googled that. I don't, I don't know and I, I'm not going to. I trust you. <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> okay. Thanks again. I All look right. forward to catching up for round two. Thank okay. you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thanks for listening to the podcast show, Better Business, Better Life. My name is Deborah Chantry-Taylor. I'm an EOS implementer, family business advisor, business and leadership coach, podcaster, and speaker. However, I'm also a business owner with several current business interests. I'm fortunate to have lived the high life with all the lifestyle, the toys, you name it, and then I've lost it all, not only once, but twice in two spectacular train wrecks. I know what it's like to experience the highs and lows. I came across EOS when they launched into New Zealand using my entrepreneur's playground and event center in Parnell, Auckland. I love the simplicity of the tools and their philosophies fitted my personal brand statement perfectly. The brilliance is in the simplicity. I've always been passionate about seeing entrepreneurs lead a life they love, and now I help them live that EOS life. Doing what they love, with people they love, making a huge difference in the world, being compensated appropriately, and with time to pursue other passions. If you want more information or want to get in contact about using EOS in your business, you can visit my website at debra.coach. That's www.debra.coach. Thanks for listening.